This is CBN News Watch. And thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ephraim Graham. President Donald Trump faces a May 12th deadline to certify the Iranian nuclear deal. Monday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu provided a pres the president a powerful argument to leave the deal. As Chris Mitchell reports, Netanyahu made a dramatic presentation showing evidence Iran has maintained a secret nuclear program for years. Well, tonight I'm here to tell you one thing. Iran lied. In a well-planned primetime expose, Netanyahu unveiled thousands of files and documents taken straight from Iran's secret atomic archives. We've known for years that Iran had a secret nuclear weapons program called Project Ahmad. We can now prove that Project Ahmad was a comprehensive program to design build and test nuclear weapons. Netanyahu said the plan sought to put nuclear bombs on ballistic missiles. Then, after signing the nuclear deal in 2015, Iran hid its nuclear files. Even after the deal, Iran continued to preserve and expand its nuclear weapons know-how for future use. Why would a terrorist regime hide and meticulously catalog its secret nuclear files if not to use them at a later date. At a Rose Garden press conference moments after Netanyahu's revelations, President Trump addressed the nuclear agreement's upcoming May 12th deadline, when he must certify to Congress Iran is in compliance of the deal. We'll see what happens. I, I'm not telling you what I'm doing, but a lot of people think they know. And on or before the 12th, we'll make a decision. That doesn't mean we won't negotiate a real agreement. After Trump's comments and Netanyahu's presentation, Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif tweeted, President Trump is jumping on a rehash of old allegations already dealt with by the IAEA to nix the deal. How convenient. Coordinated timing of alleged revelations by the boy who cries wolf just days before May 12. Netanyahu said the U.S. verified the documents and Israel plans to share the information with France, Germany, and the International Atomic Energy Agency. So here's the bottom line. Iran continues to lie. Just last week, Zarif said this. We never wanted to produce a bomb. Again? We never wanted to produce a bomb. Yes, you did. Yes, you do. And the Atomic Archive proves it. Netanyahu then called on the U.S. to take the lead. And in a few days' time, President Trump will make his decision on what to do with the nuclear deal. I'm sure he'll do the right thing. The right thing for the United States, the right thing for Israel, and the right thing for the peace of the world. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. And here now is a look at some of the other big headlines we're following for you inside the CBN newsroom today. More than 150 migrants are still camped out in Tijuana, Mexico. They're requesting asylum here in the United States, but only eight people are being processed by border officials. The migrants are mostly women and children who say they fear for their lives. The White House is postponing its decision to impose tariffs on several countries. For the next 30 days, the U.S. will not impose steel and aluminum tariffs on the EU, Canada, and Mexico. The Trump administration also says it's reached an agreement with South Korea, Argentina, Australia, and Brazil on steel imports. Roy Moore, the former U.S. Senate candidate, has filed a lawsuit against some of the women who accused him of sexual misconduct. Moore believes the four women were part of a political conspiracy to derail his Senate run in 2017. He says their accusations are false. And you can read more about these stories and others throughout the day at CBNNews.com. President Trump is considering the border between North Korea and South Korea for his proposed summit with North Korea's dictator Kim Jong-un. He said Monday, quote, there's something that he likes about meeting at the border known as the demilitarized zone because you're there. Here's Charlie Marin. And I think President Trump may meet Kim Jong-un in the heavily fortified Korean demilitarized zone, also known as the DMZ, for his upcoming summit. He hinted at the idea on Twitter early Monday. Numerous countries are being considered for the meeting, but would Peace House, Freedom House on the border of North and South Korea be a more representative, important and lasting site than a third party country, Trump tweeted, just asking. 
In addition to his tweet, the president also talked about the possibility in a Rose Garden press conference Monday afternoon. Well, it was an interesting thought, and I had that thought. Uh, we're looking at various countries, including Singapore, and uh, we are also talking about the possibility of the DMZ. Peace House, Freedom House, and there's something that I thought was intriguing. I think that some people maybe don't like the look of that, and some people like it very much. I threw it out today as an idea. I also told uh, President Moon, and through President Moon, we connected with uh, North Korea. Uh, there's something that I like about it because you're there. You're actually there, where if things work out, there's a great celebration to be had on the site, not in a third-party country. But there's still skepticism about how much the North can be trusted. From National Security Advisor John Bolton says uh, Trump will insist that North Korea dismantle its entire nuclear program and agree to international verification before any concessions can be agreed. But Bolton points out that North Korea hasn't lived up to its promises in the past. And now, it's also the case that they've lied about it and broken their commitments, which is one reason there's nobody in the Trump administration starry-eyed about what, uh, what may happen here. And in South Korea, President Moon Jae-in shook off a suggestion that he receive the Nobel Peace Prize, saying Trump can take the Nobel Prize for jump-starting peace talks with North Korea, as long as the Koreas receive peace in return. Here at home, both Republicans and Democrats have given Trump credit for bringing North Korea to the negotiating table, but reaching a worthwhile agreement could still be difficult. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Actress Ashley Judd has filed a lawsuit against disgraced Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. Judd claiming that he damaged her career by blocking her from getting major movie roles for decades as retaliation after she rejected his sexual request during a hotel room visit in 1997. My rebuffing illegal sexual harassment in a hotel room that Harvey Weinstein lied about me and interfered with my economic opportunity and blocked me from being cast in Lord of the Rings. Weinstein has denied any allegations of sexual misconduct and has not yet commented on Judd's lawsuit. Judd says that she will donate any money won in the civil suit to the Time's Up movement, which fights sexual harassment in the workplace. Gateway Church founder and pastor Robert Morris is giving thanks to the thousands of people who prayed for his recovery while he battled a life-threatening illness. More than 290,000 people joined in prayer for the pastor after he began suffering from internal bleeding in early April. He posted a video on Facebook Sunday night saying, I thank the Lord that I am still alive, but I also thank you because I know your prayers made a difference. Pastor Morris, pastor Morris is now home and he's continuing his recovery. Coming up, a new push to reach America's unreached college campuses. We're going to break down what's behind every campus movement next. Welcome back. National ministries serving college students today face multiple challenge. First, they only operate only about 40 percent of all college campuses, and even some of those universities want to push them out. But as Heather Sells reports, instead of giving up, Two major ministries are fighting back with a new movement to reach every campus. InterVarsity and crew are hoping to reach unreached campuses across the country, and one of them is right here in Orange County, California. Until recently, Santa Ana College in Southern California counted itself as one of more than the 1,800 unreached college campuses in the country. That means no organized gospel witness on campus. Shannon Comper develops leaders for CREW, formerly Campus Crusade for Christ. It takes a lot to launch movements in new locations and, and even to sustain what we have. It takes a lot of resources, whether it's people, money. That's one reason CREW is joining with InterVarsity to bring in churches and other Christian groups to find new, more efficient ways to reach those unreached campuses. The movement is aptly named Every Campus. So it's actually multiplying our efforts. Instead of competing with each other, we want to complement each other. Students Jerry Requena and Tammy Pacheco are making it happen at Santa Ana. Both are volunteer leaders mentored by InterVarsity staff. 
Pacheco drives half an hour from her college to Santa Ana to organize Bible studies. To want to see every single campus have a ministry is like a huge, like crazy goal, but it stems from like a thirst to see people re like reached by Jesus. Requena studies at Santa Ana and maintains a demanding work schedule, but says he's convinced God wants him to minister on this campus. There's no good reason not to uh, sacrifice some time. You know, there's no, some, there's no good reason to not work hard, even if I have to lose sleep, you know, for the Lord, first and foremost, you know. Tom Allen oversees the Southern California region for InterVarsity. He sees this move as radically changing campus ministry. Traditionally, InterVarsity placed several full-time workers at one location. We're sort of breaking that paradigm open and saying there's campuses around us that we haven't even really seen. Now, InterVarsity hopes to use volunteer student leaders, local churches, and other Christian organizations for outreach. Those campuses include community colleges, historically black colleges, and even online students. I think some moments of humility say, God, you've, you have, uh, uh, we have not seen the, the harvest fields around us. And the fields are ripe. InterVarsity says some 4,500 students made decisions for Christ last year, double the number 10 years ago. Still, in the midst of this harvest, an ominous trend is picking up steam. Many universities have taken non-discrimination policies designed to keep students safe and use them against Christian clubs. The schools often tell Christian student groups they can't require a statement of faith. If they refuse, the university will no longer recognize the club. 70% of the universities are just saying the non-discrimination policy prohibits student groups from discriminating. Therefore, what you're doing is discrimination. We should bar you. In following this trend, Greg Howe says Christian groups can lose the privilege of reserving rooms on campus and recruiting members at student fairs. Plus, there's a social cost. Other student groups and professors, um, student administrators will tell students, don't join that group, they're not recognized. But how is more concerned with the long-term outlook? I think what you're watching is actually a fundamental reorganization of how universities deal with religious groups, which sets up the next generation of leaders in our country to assume that religious groups should be sidelined or restricted from the public square. While Howe expects to see more of this in the coming years, he's not alarmed, citing persecution faced by the early church. He believes the best strategy is going directly to university administrators. In many of those cases, we're able to talk with the university to say, if you want to create a truly diverse, inclusive, tolerant environment, help the religious groups stay distinctly religious. Howe says student leaders can also highlight their many service projects and explain how ministry groups serve as a safety net for many minority students. Today's students make up the most diverse generation to set foot on America's campuses. As digital natives, they're processing information and images in seconds. And most important, they're creating new strategies to reach their friends with the gospel in a time when the good news is not always welcomed. They want to change the planet. They, they want the environment of the planet to be a positive one. And so I have a lot of hope for the future because of these college students today. Reporting in Southern California, Heather Sells, CBN News. Still ahead, our founding fathers shaped our nation. Today we're exploring what shaped them. When we celebrate leaders who helped to shape America and make America great, it is important to remember leaders like George Washington, who joined a remarkable group steeped in an education and faith that helped to create this free nation. As Paul Strand reports, some say, though, it is sad today's students aren't learning the true forces behind these leaders. When you look at the miracle of the American Revolution, a critical combination was God's timing plus the leaders chosen to carry it out. Teaching about the intense education and deep curiosity of our founding fathers is author Jenny Cody's passion. 
they studied ancient civilizations, and I don't mean just like AP history, you know, and dates and facts and stuff. They studied how governments work. They studied ancient Rome, ancient Greece. They studied philosophy, how men thought. Cody wrote The Voice, The Revolution, and The Key to better connect our younger generation with America's founders. My life's purpose is to get kids excited about history and make them fall in love with it. In this book, the author uses talking animals to help the future leaders when they're children. One is a young Benjamin Franklin reading in depth about ancient leaders' character, virtues, and vices. Plutarch's Life, Benjamin Franklin, 11 years old, that was his favorite book. Have you read Plutarch's Lives? I just read it to write this book, and it's pretty complicated. Young George Washington wrote in longhand 110 principles put together by Jesuits about how to live right and be a gentleman. What 12-year-old today do you think would take the time to have a journal and to handwrite out rules of civility and civil discourse? I mean, he wrote down these principles so he would learn them. Colonial society at this time was pretty much based on the lessons and literature of Christianity. Children were learning their ABCs based on Bible characters. Today's public schools not only don't teach out of the Bible, they don't teach how important Christianity was to most of the founding fathers. Or they suggest founders like Washington and Thomas Jefferson were deists, believers in only a distant and uninvolved God. Yet Washington stated after surviving a battle where his coat was punctured by numerous bullets and two horses were shot dead beneath him, I was saved by the miraculous care of providence that saved me beyond human expectation. Patrick Henry, the man who shouted, give me liberty or give me death, stated, there is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations. As a young man, Patrick Henry was right in the middle of the first great awakening and the battle for greater religious liberty in the colonies. The war for religious freedom was happening under his own roof. Henry's father and uncle were Anglicans in Virginia's state church. However, his mother, Sarah, was a bit of a rebel and she went with this new Great Awakening dissenter movement. She would take her son to hear evangelists preach in this first national revival. The experience helped form him into the mighty order eventually labeled the voice of the revolution. His voice for freedom and stand against the high taxes of the Stamp Act helped ignite the revolution. A decade before we even declared independence, he was the first one to speak up against tyranny. That's when Sam Adams and the boys and the Sons of Liberty was like, look at these guys in Virginia. We need to be that bold. And so isn't it amazing how one voice speaking up for liberty against tyranny can change the world. And he joined many bold leaders educated for just that moment in time. They understood that liberty is precious because it had been oppressed you know, over the centuries and they studied it. And so because they studied what worked in history, they could smell a tyrant coming 3,000 miles away and they were ready. While Cody also points out their failures, like Patrick Henry owning slaves. I'm showing his struggle with slavery you know, where he says it's a lamentable evil. I cannot justify it. I cannot believe I'm a Christian, yet I do this. There's no excuse. But she finds it horrible that schools are shying away from teaching the great and good stories of America's first decades and its founders just because of their dark side. To the point where I heard recently that some school curriculums are gonna start teaching in 1866. Oh, let's just skip over the whole founding of our nation because it's too painful. Cody holds patriot camps with kids and often ask what will happen if children don't learn their nation's history. I said, we'd lose our future. And I said, whose responsibility is it to keep telling the stories of our history? And you know what they said? It's ours. So if kids are willing to own it, let's just teach it to them. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. Indeed, let's keep our history alive. Stay with us. There's much more of CBN News Watch coming up and it's coming up after this. CBN Superbook is winning young lives for Jesus in the Balkans. CBN International hosted events in Macedonia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina, introducing children to the heroes of the Bible. About 500 children from 2 to 10 years old attended the event. The children played games, sang songs, danced, watched a Superbook episode, and learned a Bible lesson. At the end, the children were all very thrilled to meet the Superbook character, Gizmo. Well, right now, it's time for your Tuesday Tweetable. This is a message I pray will bless you and motivate you to post, tag, tweet, and share it with others. Consider this. When you're faced with a problem that just doesn't make sense, respond with a praise that also doesn't make sense. Remember, God responds to praise. He is moved by our faith. With that word, we encourage you to make this a terrific Tuesday. 
Remember, you can always find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. And we love to hear from you. So take the time to tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here today or any day. You can do that by emailing newswatch at CBN.com. You can also reach out and touch us always on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us again right here next time. Remember, the news continues 24-7 at CBNNews.com. Hope to see you there, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Goodbye, everybody, and God bless.